2,000 years ago, hidden within the pages of an ancient text, there lay terrifying truths about the human race, truths that have been shrouded, debated, and deliberately obscured for centuries. This isn't just about faith or theology, it's about unraveling secrets that could reshape our very understanding of existence. The Bible, as we know it, starts with a story that's been simplified and stripped of its most powerful elements. Many people have heard the tale of Adam and Eve, the creation of humanity, but have you ever wondered if this story was merely the sanitized version? Buried deep in some of the oldest scriptures, and even in texts excluded from the canon, there are whispers of other beginnings. These alternative accounts paint a picture of humanity not as God's perfect creation, but as the result of an experiment, a cosmic experiment gone wrong. According to ancient sources, like the Gnostic texts and the controversial Book of Jubilees, humanity was created amidst conflict, dissent, and rebellion. These scriptures suggest that creation was not a harmonious act by an all-loving deity, but rather a power struggle between celestial beings, each with their own agenda. What if humanity wasn't created out of love or purpose, but as an unintended consequence, born of competition, or worse, as slaves for a higher power? The Gnostic texts, in particular, provide a radical reimagining of the creation story. In their accounts, a lesser divine being, often called the Demiurge, created the physical world and humanity. The Demiurge is portrayed not as an all-knowing, benevolent creator, but as a jealous, flawed entity who sought to trap divine sparks of consciousness within material bodies. This being was not acting in humanity's best interest, rather, it was driven by ego, pride, and a desire to dominate. Humanity, therefore, became a byproduct of this celestial being's desire for control, a creation made not out of love, but out of a need to exert power. The Gnostics believed that the true divine essence, a supreme, unknowable God, was separate from the material world. This higher God had no hand in creating the physical universe. Instead, humanity's divine essence was trapped within a flawed creation, yearning to return to its true source. The physical world, including humanity, was seen as a prison, a place of limitation, suffering, and ignorance. The Gnostic creation myth paints a picture of humanity caught between two forces, the corrupt, egotistical demiurge and the transcendent divine essence that sought to free us. The Book of Jubilees, on the other hand, offers yet another perspective. It suggests that the creation of humanity was influenced by multiple divine beings who held different views on what humanity should be. Some sought to create beings in their image, capable of greatness and divinity, while others wanted to keep humanity limited, subservient, and obedient. The result was a compromise, a being with divine potential, yet bound by the limitations of the physical body. This compromise meant that humanity was never meant to be flawless or perfect. Instead, we were created as beings of duality, capable of both profound wisdom and devastating ignorance. These alternative accounts challenge the comforting idea of humanity being the centerpiece of creation. Instead, they imply that we were an afterthought, a byproduct of a celestial battleground. The creation of humanity was not a single divine act of love but a contested process, shaped by conflicting desires and agendas. This knowledge reveals that our very essence is a mix of divine potential and limitation, a product of conflict and compromise among powerful celestial beings. Imagine what this means for our understanding of our place in the universe. If humanity was created amidst conflict and compromise, it means we were never destined for an idyllic life. We were never meant to live in blissful ignorance or perfect harmony. Instead, our existence has always been marked by struggle, by the tension between our divine potential and our physical limitations. We are beings caught between worlds, between the material and the spiritual, between ignorance and knowledge, between bondage and freedom. This knowledge is both terrifying and empowering, for it means that our destiny is not predetermined. We have the power to transcend our limitations, to awaken the divine spark within us, and to break free from the prison of ignorance. The terrifying knowledge doesn't end there. One of the most debated topics is the plurality of gods mentioned in early texts. You see, our modern translations of the Bible say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But in the oldest Hebrew manuscripts, the word used is Elohim, a plural noun. Elohim suggests a council of gods, not just one. 
Ancient Sumerian texts, which bear striking similarities to early biblical stories, also speak of a pantheon of gods, each playing a role in humanity's creation and early history. This convergence of Sumerian mythology and early Hebrew scripture hints that the truth about God might be far more complex. Imagine a council, or a collective, debating whether humanity should exist at all, and what form we should take. Not one divine plan, but a compromise between beings of unimaginable power, some of whom may not have had our best interests at heart. The concept of Elohim as a council of gods brings us back to the ancient Near Eastern worldview, where divinity was often understood as a collective rather than a singular entity. In the Mesopotamian pantheon, gods like Anu, Enlil, and Enki each played specific roles in the creation and governance of the world. Anu was the sky god, Enlil was the god of air and authority, and Enki was the god of wisdom and creation. These gods often worked together, but they also had their own agendas, sometimes conflicting with one another. This complex interplay of divine forces is reflected in the early Hebrew concept of Elohim, a collective of divine beings deliberating over the creation of humanity. The implications of this are profound. If humanity was created by a council of gods, it suggests that our existence was not the result of a singular divine vision, but rather a negotiated outcome. Each god had their own motivations, their own desires for what humanity should be. Some may have wanted us to be powerful and wise, capable of great things. Others may have wanted us to remain subservient, limited, and easily controlled. The result was a compromise, a being that had the potential for greatness, but was also bound by limitations. This plurality of divinity also explains the inconsistencies and contradictions found within the early biblical texts. In some passages, God is portrayed as loving, merciful, and forgiving. In others, he is wrathful, vengeful, and demanding. These differing portrayals reflect the influence of multiple divine beings, each with their own characteristics and agendas. The Bible, therefore, is not the story of a single, unified God, but rather the story of a collective of gods, each shaping humanity in their own way. The ancient Sumerian texts provide further insight into this complex relationship between gods and humans. According to these texts, humanity was created to serve the gods, to provide them with labor, worship, and sustenance. The gods needed humanity, not out of love or compassion, but out of necessity. They required beings who could till the earth, build temples, and offer sacrifices. This utilitarian view of humanity's purpose is echoed in the early Hebrew scriptures, where the role of humanity is often portrayed as one of servitude and obedience. But within this narrative of servitude lies the seed of rebellion. The very fact that humanity was created by a collective of gods, each with their own motivations, means that our existence is not bound by a single divine plan. We have the potential to transcend our original purpose, to break free from the limitations imposed upon us, and to assert our independence. This is the true meaning of the story of the Tower of Babel, an act of defiance, an attempt by humanity to reach the heavens and assert our own destiny. The gods, fearful of what humanity might achieve, intervened and scattered us, but the desire for freedom and transcendence remains within us. Perhaps the most terrifying piece of knowledge hidden in these ancient scriptures revolves around the Nephilim. In Genesis 6 verse 4, there is a brief mention of these beings, the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. Mainstream interpretations often gloss over this, reducing it to myth or an insignificant detail. But what if this was a crucial part of our early history? The Book of Enoch, which was excluded from the canonical Bible, goes into disturbing detail. It describes a group of angels, known as the Watchers, who defy divine law and descended to earth to mate with human women. Their offspring, the Nephilim, were giants, powerful, fearsome, and ultimately destructive. They were not part of God's plan, they were a deviation, a manifestation of rebellion. The Watchers, according to the Book of Enoch, were originally tasked with watching over humanity. They were meant to be protectors, guides, and intermediaries between the divine and the mortal. However, they became enamored with the beauty of human women and chose to abandon their divine duty. This decision to descend to earth and take human wives was not just an act of disobedience, it was an act of rebellion against the established divine order. 
The Watcher sought to create something new, something that combined the divine with the mortal, a hybrid race that would possess the qualities of both. The offspring of this union, the Nephilim, were giants, beings of immense power and stature. They were not only physically imposing, but also possessed a unique blend of divine and human characteristics. The Nephilim were described as mighty warriors, rulers, and even tyrants who dominated the early world. They were beings of great strength, but also of great corruption. Their existence brought chaos, violence, and suffering to the earth. The Nephilim were not part of the divine plan for humanity, they were an aberration, a deviation that threatened to upend the balance between the divine and the mortal. The presence of the Nephilim in the early world had profound implications for humanity. The Nephilim were not bound by the same limitations as ordinary humans. They had knowledge, power, and abilities that set them apart, and they used these qualities to dominate and subjugate the human population. The Book of Enoch describes a world in which the Nephilim ruled as kings and tyrants, imposing their will upon humanity and leading the world into a state of corruption and chaos. The terrifying knowledge here is that humanity's early history was not a peaceful, idyllic existence in a garden paradise. It was a time of fear, oppression, and violence, marked by the presence of beings who were beyond human control. The Nephilim represented a corruption of the divine order, a reminder that the boundary between the divine and the mortal was not as impermeable as we might think. The Watchers, in their rebellion, had brought divine power to Earth, but it was a corrupted, twisted version of that power, one that led to suffering and destruction. The Nephilim also serve as a symbol of humanity's vulnerability. Our ancestors were caught in the middle of a cosmic conflict, subjected to the whims of powerful beings who operated beyond their understanding. The Nephilim were not just giants, they were a reminder of the fragility of the human condition, of how easily we can be influenced, dominated, and corrupted by forces beyond our control. The Nephilim were a living testament to the dangers of crossing the boundary between the divine and the mortal, of attempting to merge two realms that were never meant to coexist. The existence of the Nephilim also raises unsettling questions about the nature of divinity and its relationship with humanity. If the Watchers, who were divine beings, could be corrupted by desire and abandon their duty, what does that say about the nature of the divine? The Watchers were not infallible, they were beings of great power, but they were also capable of weakness, temptation, and rebellion. This challenges the traditional view of the divine as perfect and unchanging. Instead, it reveals a more complex picture, one in which even the divine can be fallible, driven by desire, and capable of making choices that have profound consequences for humanity. The story of Noah and the Great Flood is often told as a tale of divine mercy, God saving the righteous from a corrupt world. But when viewed through the lens of ancient texts, it takes on a darker, more terrifying meaning. The flood wasn't just about wiping out sinful humanity, it was a reset button, an attempt to undo the contamination brought about by the Nephilim. In the Book of Jubilees and other non-canonical texts, there is a clear implication that the flood was not just an act of punishment, but of desperation. The world had gone off script, and the only way to restore balance was to erase most of what had been created. Imagine a creator so overwhelmed by the unintended consequences of free will that the only solution was mass destruction. This wasn't a story of love and redemption, it was one of regret, fear, and the struggle to regain control. The Great Flood, as described in the Book of Jubilees, was a direct response to the corruption that had spread throughout the earth due to the influence of the Watchers and their offspring, the Nephilim. The Nephilim had brought chaos, violence, and immorality to the world, and humanity had been caught in the crossfire. The world had become a place of suffering, oppression, and corruption, far from the divine vision of harmony and balance. The flood was not merely a punishment for humanity's sins, it was an attempt to cleanse the earth of the corruption that had taken hold, to wipe the slate clean and start anew. The decision to bring about the flood was not made lightly. The Book of Jubilees describes the anguish and regret felt by the divine beings as they witnessed the state of the world. The Creator looked upon the earth and saw that it had become corrupted, that the very fabric of creation had been tainted by the actions of the Watchers and the Nephilim. The Flood was an act of desperation, a last resort to restore order to a world that had spiraled out of control. It was a recognition that the experiment of free will had gone awry, that the divine plan had been subverted by forces beyond control. 
Noah, in this narrative, was not just a righteous man chosen for his piety. He was a symbol of hope, a remnant of what humanity could be, untainted by the corruption of the Nephilim. Noah's family represented the possibility of a new beginning, a chance to rebuild the world without the influence of the fallen angels and their offspring. The Ark was not just a vessel of salvation, it was a symbol of hope, a beacon of light in a world engulfed by darkness. The flood was not a simple act of divine justice. It was an acknowledgement that the world had gone off script, that the divine plan had been derailed by the actions of rebellious beings. The flood was a reset button, an attempt to undo the damage and restore balance to creation. But it was also a reminder of the fragility of the divine plan, of how easily it could be subverted by forces beyond control. The flood was not just about punishing humanity, it was about erasing the mistakes of the past and trying to create a new future. The story of the flood also raises unsettling questions about the nature of free will and the consequences of human choices. The Watchers had made a choice to rebel, to abandon their duty and descend to Earth. Humanity, in turn, had made choices that led to corruption and chaos. The flood was the result of those choices, a reminder that free will comes with consequences, and that those consequences can be far-reaching and devastating. The flood was a stark reminder of the delicate balance between freedom and responsibility, between the power to choose and the consequences of those choices. The flood was also a reminder of the limitations of divine power. The creator, in this narrative, was not an all-powerful being who could simply will the world back into order. The corruption brought about by the Watchers and the Nephilim was so deep, so pervasive, that the only solution was to start over. The Flood was an acknowledgement of the limits of divine intervention, of the fact that even the Creator could not simply undo the damage that had been done. It was a humbling recognition that the world had gone beyond the point of no return, and that the only way forward was to begin again. One of the most chilling questions is why humanity was given consciousness at all. The story of the Garden of Eden is often interpreted as a simple tale of disobedience, Eve eating the forbidden fruit. But what if it was more than that? What if the real forbidden knowledge was the awareness of our own existence, the terrifying ability to question, to reason, and to ultimately rebel? Gnostic texts speak of the serpent in Eden not as a villain, but as a liberator, a being who wanted humanity to have the same knowledge as the gods. Eating from the tree of knowledge wasn't the fall of man, it was the beginning of our freedom. But freedom comes with a price, the burden of awareness, of mortality, of suffering. The terrifying knowledge here is that consciousness itself was perhaps the greatest burden ever placed upon humanity, a double-edged sword that gave us the ability to create, to love, to destroy, and to despair. The story of the Garden of Eden, as told in the book of Genesis, is often understood as a tale of innocence lost, of humanity's fall from grace. But the Gnostic interpretation offers a different perspective. In this version, the serpent is not an embodiment of evil but a symbol of enlightenment, a being who sought to free humanity from the bondage of ignorance. The serpent offered Eve the fruit of the tree of knowledge, not as a temptation to sin, but as an invitation to awaken, to become aware of her own existence, her own potential, and the true nature of the world around her. The knowledge that Eve gained by eating the fruit was not simply an understanding of good and evil, it was the awareness of her own consciousness. It was the realization that she was not just a passive being, existing at the whim of a divine creator, but an individual with the power to make choices, to shape her own destiny. This awareness was both liberating and terrifying, for it meant that humanity was no longer bound by the limitations of ignorance. We had the power to question, to reason, to create, but also the burden of knowing our own mortality, our own capacity for suffering, and the consequences of our actions. The Gnostic interpretation of the Garden of Eden challenges the traditional view of the Fall as a negative event. Instead, it presents the Fall as a necessary step in humanity's evolution, the moment when we became truly human. Before eating the fruit, Adam and Eve were like children, existing in a state of blissful ignorance, unaware of the complexities of life. They had no knowledge of good and evil, no understanding of their own mortality, no sense of their own potential. By eating the fruit, they gained the ability to think, to question, to create, and to love. They became conscious beings, capable of experiencing the full range of human emotions, both joy and suffering. But this awakening came with a price. 
the knowledge of good and evil brought with it the burden of choice. Adam and Eve were no longer innocent, no longer protected from the harsh realities of existence. They became aware of their own mortality, their own vulnerability, and the potential for both greatness and destruction within themselves. This is the terrifying knowledge that was hidden within the ancient scriptures, the realization that consciousness is both a gift and a curse. It gives us the power to create, to love, to innovate, but it also makes us aware of our own limitations, our own mortality, and the consequences of our actions. The story of the Garden of Eden is not just about the loss of paradise, it is about the birth of human consciousness. It is about the moment when humanity became aware of itself, when we gained the ability to question, to reason, and to rebel. The serpent, in this narrative, is not a villain but a liberator, a being who sought to free humanity from the bondage of ignorance. By offering the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the serpent gave humanity the greatest gift, the gift of awareness, the ability to see the world as it truly is, and the power to shape our own destiny. But with this gift came the burden of suffering. The awareness of our own existence brings with it the knowledge of our own mortality, the inevitability of death, and the potential for both joy and pain. The story of the Garden of Eden is a reminder that consciousness is not a simple gift, it is a double-edged sword, a burden that we must carry with us throughout our lives. It is the source of our greatest achievements, but also the cause of our deepest fears and anxieties. Another controversial element hidden in the scriptures is the role of Satan. In the book of Job, Satan is not depicted as the embodiment of evil, but as a member of God's court, an adversary, yes, but one who works with God to test humanity. This is a far cry from the figure of pure malevolence we see in modern interpretations. The terrifying knowledge here is that Satan might not be the rogue enemy we've been led to believe. Instead, he could be part of the divine mechanism, a necessary adversary whose role is to challenge and test. This means that the suffering and trials we face are not simply the result of evil forces opposing God, but are part of a divine plan, one that uses suffering as a means of growth. It's a chilling thought that the pain and hardship we endure are not accidents, but intentional tests said by a divine being who values our spiritual development over our comfort. In the book of Job, Satan is portrayed as a member of the divine council, a being who serves a specific role within the divine order. He is not depicted as an enemy of God, but rather as an adversary, a being whose purpose is to test the faith and character of humanity. In this narrative, Satan approaches God and questions the righteousness of Job, suggesting that Jard's faith is only strong because he has been blessed with prosperity and protection. God permits Satan to test Job, allowing him to bring suffering and hardship into Jard's life in order to prove the depth of his faith. This portrayal of Satan challenges the traditional view of him as the embodiment of pure evil, constantly working against God and seeking to lead humanity astray. Instead, Satan is depicted as a necessary part of the divine plan, a being whose role is to test, to challenge, and to ultimately help humanity grow. The trials and tribulations that Satan brings are not meant to destroy humanity, but to reveal the true nature of our character, to strengthen our faith, and to help us grow spiritually. The suffering and hardship we face in life may not be random acts of evil, but intentional tests said by a divine being. Satan's role as an adversary is not to destroy, but to challenge, to push us to our limits, to force us to confront our fears, our weaknesses, and our doubts. This means that the pain and suffering we endure are not accidents, but part of a divine plan designed to help us grow. It is a chilling thought, for it means that our suffering is not meaningless, but is instead an integral part of our spiritual journey. The Book of Job also raises questions about the nature of divine justice. Job is described as a righteous man, yet he is subjected to immense suffering, not because he has done anything wrong, but because his faith is being tested. This challenges the traditional notion that suffering is always a punishment for sin. Instead, it suggests that suffering can be a test, a means of refining our character and deepening our faith. The role of Satan in this narrative is not to bring about Job's downfall, but to reveal the true depth of his faith and righteousness. This understanding of Satan's role also has implications for how we view the nature of God. If Satan is part of the divine mechanism, it means that God permits, and even orchestrates, the trials and suffering that we face. This challenges the comforting notion of God as an all-loving, benevolent being who only desires our happiness. 
Instead, it reveals a more complex picture, a God who values our spiritual growth over our comfort, who allows us to face hardship in order to help us grow stronger. This is a terrifying thought, for it means that the divine plan is not focused on our comfort or happiness, but on our development and growth as spiritual beings. The role of Satan as an adversary also raises questions about the nature of free will. If Satan's purpose is to test us, it means that we have the freedom to choose how we respond to those tests. We can choose to remain faithful, to endure, and to grow, or we can choose to give in to despair, to lose faith, and to turn away from the divine. The trials we face are opportunities for growth, but they also come with the risk of failure. This is the true meaning of free will, the ability to choose how we respond to the challenges and tests that are placed before us. The terrifying knowledge here is that Satan is not the rogue enemy we have been led to believe. He is part of the divine mechanism, a necessary adversary whose role is to challenge and test. The suffering and trials we face are not simply the result of evil forces opposing God, but are part of a divine plan, one that uses suffering as a means of growth. It is a chilling thought, for it means that the pain and hardship we endure are not accidents, but intentional tests said by a divine being who values our spiritual development over our comfort. The book of Revelation is often seen as a prophecy of the end times, a final, terrifying judgment. But what if it's not the end, but a return to the beginning? Ancient interpretations suggest that the apocalypse is not about destruction, but about renewal, a cyclical event where the world is purged and reborn. This ties back to the concept of the Great Flood, another reset, another attempt to correct what went wrong. Humanity might be trapped in a loop, a never-ending cycle of creation, corruption, and destruction. Every time we gain knowledge, every time we assert our independence, the system resets. We are like lab rats in a cosmic experiment, allowed to run the maze, but always brought back to the start once we reach too far beyond our designated boundaries. The book of Revelation, with its vivid imagery of destruction, judgment, and renewal, has long been interpreted as a prophecy of the end of the world. But ancient interpretations suggest that it is not simply about the end, but about a return to the beginning, a cyclical event in which the world is purged of its corruption and reborn anew. This idea of cyclical time is not unique to the Bible, it is a concept found in many ancient cultures, from the Hindu notion of the Yugas to the Mayan calendar. The apocalypse, in this sense, is not the end of all things, but the end of one cycle and the beginning of another. The concept of cyclical time suggests that humanity is trapped in a loop, a never-ending cycle of creation, corruption, and destruction. The story of the Great Flood is an example of this cycle. The world had become corrupted, and so it was purged and reset. Humanity was given a new beginning, a chance to start over. But over time, the cycle repeated itself. The corruption returned, the balance was lost, and the world once again descended into chaos. The apocalypse is simply another reset, another attempt to correct what has gone wrong. Humanity may be doomed to repeat this cycle endlessly. Every time we gain knowledge, every time we assert our independence, the system resets. We are allowed to progress to a certain point, but once we reach beyond our designated boundaries, we are brought back to the beginning. It is as if we are part of a cosmic experiment, allowed to run the maze, but always brought back to the start once we reach too far. The apocalypse is not just about divine judgment, it is about maintaining control, about ensuring that humanity does not transcend its limitations. The imagery of the apocalypse in the book of Revelation is filled with symbols of destruction, fire, plagues, earthquakes, and the fall of Babylon. But it is also filled with symbols of renewal, a new heaven and a new earth, the return of the divine order, and the establishment of a new Jerusalem. This duality of destruction and renewal suggests that the apocalypse is not about the annihilation of all things, but about the purification of creation. The old, corrupted world must be destroyed in order for a new, pure world to be born. It is a return to the beginning, a chance to start over, to create a world that is free from the corruption and chaos that have plagued it. The cyclical nature of the apocalypse also raises questions about the nature of divine justice. If humanity is constantly being reset, constantly being brought back to the beginning, what does that say about our ability to learn and grow? Are we doomed to repeat the same mistakes over and over again, never truly progressing, never truly reaching our potential? 
The idea that the apocalypse is a reset button suggests that there is a limit to how far humanity is allowed to go. We are allowed to progress to a certain point, but once we reach beyond that point, we are brought back to the beginning. It is as if there is a ceiling on our potential, a limit to how far we are allowed to reach. The apocalypse may not be the final judgment, but simply another cycle in an endless loop. We are not moving towards a final destination, but simply repeating the same cycle over and over again. Every time we gain knowledge, every time we assert our independence, we are brought back to the beginning. The apocalypse is not about the end of all things, it is about maintaining control, about ensuring that humanity does not transcend its limitations. It is a reminder that our existence is not linear, but cyclical, a never-ending loop of creation, corruption, and destruction. The idea that humanity is trapped in a loop is both terrifying and humbling. It means that our progress is not guaranteed, that our achievements are not permanent. We may build great civilizations, make incredible discoveries, and push the boundaries of what is possible, but in the end, we are always brought back to the beginning. The apocalypse is a reminder that the forces that govern our existence are far beyond our control, that we are part of a cycle that has been repeating for millennia, and that we are not the masters of our own destiny. So, what do we take away from all this? The terrifying knowledge hidden in the ancient Bible is not just about celestial beings, Nephilim, or cosmic resets. It's about the nature of our existence, our origin, our purpose, and the forces that shape our destiny. We are not the perfect creation of a benevolent deity, nor are we simply pawns of a singular divine plan. We are the product of conflict, of compromise, of rebellion, and of a desire for freedom that comes at a great cost. The ancient Bible reveals a story far more complex and far more unsettling than what we've been taught. It's a story of being struggling for power, of humanity caught in the crossfire, and of the terrifying burden of consciousness, the knowledge of good and evil, of life and death, of freedom and consequence. But perhaps, in accepting this terrifying knowledge, we can find our true purpose, not as perfect beings living in blissful ignorance, but as flawed, conscious individuals capable of growth, of change, and of shaping our own destiny. Thank you all for joining us on this deep dive into the hidden truths of our ancient past. We hope this journey has challenged you, made you think, and perhaps even made you see our history in a new light. If you found this video enlightening, please like, comment, and subscribe to support the channel. Your thoughts and perspectives are invaluable, so drop them in the comments below, let's keep this conversation going. Until next time, stay curious, stay questioning, and remember, the truth is always worth seeking. God bless us all.